Hi, so everyone who is here, um, this is so hilarious that this is about virtual meetings because everything that could go wrong did truly just go wrong. So I have a broken ankle and my office computer will not let me into Zoom today. So I had to actually make it up the stairs. I won't tell you how. <laughs> Get onto my personal Mac. Obviously with a broken ankle, I don't fix my bed in the morning. So, <laughs> so, so you're getting an introduction to everything that could go wrong and how to just deal with it. So not to delay this anymore, I welcome all of you to this meeting. Um, while, while you're waiting for others to join, um, I, I'm just going to encourage you to um, use the chat function and introduce yourself to everyone. You know, you can put your name, your company. That's another thing that shouldn't be happening. It's um, to silence our phones. And one word that describes what you think when you think of Nui. Um, personally, I think of Nui as being very liberating and very forgiving as well. Um, there will be opportunities. There's going to be three sessions. Each one's 20 minutes each. They're formatted a little bit different, each one. So um, you will have the chance to be very interactive. So I encourage you, uh, you can either use the chat function or you can use the raise your hand function that's on Zoom. Um, and, and your input and your stories are what's going to make this session better than ever. Um, so please be part of it. Um, and if you want to change your screen name, uh, just hover over there's three dots uh, in your picture and a pop-up will allow you to change your name so others can see who is here. Um, so I believe we are already, oh, well past the beginning time. So we're just gonna dive right in here. Um, the so only other house housekeeping measure, Maureen, is that we are recording this. I think we need to make that disclosure. We are. To people. And I'm sorry, I, I was going to segue into my, my group segment if you were. No, uh, just so. So first, welcome to um, the Virtual Professional Program. Uh, this is uh, the first of two mentoring sessions this fall um, put on by Newey, New Hampshire. Um, and we're really glad to have you here. You did see what the agenda is, so I won't go over that again. Um, we're very... Um, very committed to confidentiality. So, you know, we're gonna follow the sister code here. So what, what is said um, in Zoom stays in the Zoom room, okay? Um, that way people will be um, more open to sharing their stories and we're going to get a lot more out of it um, doing that. We do have another mentoring program. It will be starting on November the 5th. Um, and at the end of this meeting, we're gonna ask people to say either, hey, one of those sessions, we want to do more on it, or um, suggest something else that you'd like. We also would like to thank um, Debbie because she has offered that we can stay on an extra half hour and just have sort of like a little social session. Um, so since mid-March, uh, we've had the work experiences like nothing that we could have ever prepared for. Um, that's six months months of often flying by the seat of our yoga pants. And it's not sustainable. It's not going to get us where we want to go. And we agreed that it was time to help each other with developing habits related to training, to interviewing, and to conducting and participating in collaborative meetings so that it will impact the outcomes of our future virtual lives starting today. So I'll do a big thank you at the end of this. Um, and mostly, though, the thank you is to all of you who chose to spend your next 60 minutes or maybe a little bit longer with us to become virtual professionals extraordinaire. And leading off with virtual training is Marcia Brown, attorney with New Hampshire Brown Law. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. And welcome, everybody. And thank you for helping us work through the technical difficulties, because this is an explanation of some of the technical difficulties and how to overcome them. And our first panel is going to talk about training. And now that we are in a more virtual culture than we were a year ago, uh, our approach of, to training has changed. Obviously it's gone virtual, but does this change from a physical interaction to a virtual interaction necessarily change the value we receive from training? And so our panelists today will share their insights 
discuss what has changed, what has stayed the same, and how you can get the benefits from training as you did before we all went virtual. And I'd like to welcome our first panelist is Patty Koklowski. She is the Health and Safety and Environmental Manager for First Light Power Resources, Inc. Patty is a graduate of the University of Massachusetts and holds a degree in chemical engineering. She has been in the health, safety, and environmental field for over 25 years. She has worked for a variety of companies and throughout the US. Our second panelist is Bella Cool. Bella is a systems engineer with Raytheon Technologies. Bella is a 2020 graduate from Boston University and holds a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering. Bella is currently working on a radar simulation that will be used to teach interns and new hires about the principles behind radar and missile technology. So Patty, if you would mi wouldn't mind leading us off on this discussion. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so thank you for inviting me. I'll say thank you to Carter for also inviting me to this. Um, so virtual training is definitely is posing new challenges to all of us. Um, it, one of the things that I've discovered that based on who the audience is, the challenges are different. Um, is the training for you or is the training for, for your company? Um, one of the main challenges that I'll guarantee in one of the ladies before mentioned that one of their members was falling asleep, engagement. It's going to happen and, and is critical. And I'll talk a little bit about that towards the end. Uh, one of the main things that you still need to take a look at is quality of training. Um, what, what you may want to look for in who, to, where to go for it. Uh, word of mouth is, is your best resource. Look out at your coworkers, look out for your um, people in your fields to find out what, who can give you good recommendations. Internet research, um, as always, is fantastic. Go towards your memberships. Uh, in my case, I look for the American Society of Safety Professionals or the National Safety Council. Um, so I'm looking for those type of organizations to help me. Uh, the other resource to look for is universities. Um, they have really good programs. Uh, so if you are connected to a, a university close to you or your alma mater, um, that is a great resource. Um, always ask for a curriculum or the agenda. Um, that way you know if it is applicable to what you're trying to achieve. Also remember that you can't take every course virtually. Uh, sometimes you need a combination of virtual and in, and in person. Um, the other key factor that um, is budgeting. Um, make sure if you're looking to create training for your company, you are uh, preparing uh, for the cost at budget time. If it's for you, um, I typically suggest folks to talk to your manager at review time. This is what I'm expecting. This is what I would like. Um, we are going through that right now and we go through um, what would you like to train and the question is, okay, can we do it virtually? Um, so be aware of that too. Um, one of the other things you need to think about is the preparation um, uh, for that training. It is for you. Can you log in? Um, do you know how to log in? Um, you know, what is the system? Um, so always do it ahead. Um, the other item is if you're doing it for other folks, like for your, for your company, um, make sure everybody knows how to log in and that everybody has computers and that everybody has a camera. Um, remember that we have different generations right now in the work field, and you may have people that don't have an idea to deal with, with, with a computer. Um, it also depends on your environment. Um, I've always been in either manufacturing or plants or stuff like that. And so that the, the range of experience or the range of knowledge with computers is going to vary. So be very careful if you're doing it for other people that they know how to access that. Um, the last point I wanted to bring up is engagement and is the key factor and is the most challenging part. Um, and if it's for you, you get what you put, all right? Um, so if you're really interested in it, go for it. If you're planning for your company, the one thing I tell folks is make sure you mandate the camera use uh, because people will disengage. Have your trainer, or if you're giving the training, um, ask questions. Force people to be engaged um, because if not, the, you, you will lose the group and you will lose the, the opportunity to be able um, to get something productive of virtual training, which you, it's, it's beneficial. 
So that's kind of very brief and hopefully I didn't go over my five minutes and mess up your timing. <laughs> No, oh, no problem. Um, Bella, would you please offer your perspective and insight? Sure. Um, first, I want to say thank you so much for the opportunity to even participate in this event. Um, so I, I kind of started off the, this, this pandemic uh, with a unique experience where back in April, I was finishing up my last semester at school um, and all of a sudden going, you know, towards this environment where I was all of a sudden teaching my professors how to even turn on a webcam instead of them really even teaching me. To, to now being an entry level um, professional engineer, kind of trying to figure out how to even work in a workplace um, that's entirely virtual. So as was mentioned, I'm, I'm currently working on um, the training that I actually took, um, which uh, it, in order to make it more robust, understandable, and a little bit more modern. So the goal of the training is to kind of teach new hires and interns about radar technology. Um, as well as kind of give them the hands-on introduction into how Raytheon and the department operates. Um, so I'd say one of, the, one of the major things that I personally struggled with um, during my training was um, the accessibility to resources. Um, I, I think in, in both the university and in virtual training, it's easy to you know, kind of miss or withhold asking questions um, generally due to a fear of, you know, technical issues like your microphone not working or your video camera not working, you know, or you talk over someone, plus kind of more common issues like um, not asking questions because you don't want to sound stupid or, you know, if it was already answered before, you don't want to also sound stupid that way. So I think um, if it's really important that if part of the training is done through pre-recorded videos or even just self-teaching, um, having the contact information beginning, middle, and end of the training for the experts is really important because um, I think that way the new hires can kind of reach out to these, these experts or these point of contacts on their own time and kind of through a medium that they feel most comfortable with. By medium, I mean like um, Skype messaging or texting or phone calls or video chatting or any, anything like that, um, whatever the new hire might feel mo most comfortable with. Um, I'd also say one of the biggest assets um, to me through through my onboarding um, was I was assigned a senior engineer who's a mentor. Um, so every week she kind of checks in with me, which through this has kind of given me more than enough of an opportunity to ask questions and specifically technical questions that I wouldn't necessarily feel comfortable asking my supervisor. Um, I, I think this this program that Raytheon has set up works really well for two reasons. Um, the first one being that my mentor is a woman, um, and I think in a, in a career field and a company that's, that's male-dominated, um, having someone, a mentor specifically who's a woman, it makes it a lot easier to, to reach out. Um, and the second point being that, you know, she's got a lot of experience in the company, um, so she can kind of tell me the ins and outs of it, and I can ask her a little bit more candid questions like, you know, uh, attire or anything like that. Um, but the age gap is small enough that I still feel like we can connect and I, and I feel comfortable reaching out to her. Um, so I guess to, to conclude, one of, even though I think with this reduced face-to-face -face interaction, it's, it's been a struggle, um, but I think it's also presented a really unique opportunity to kind of strengthen um, a really valuable uh, skill, which is knowing how and when to reach out and ask for help. So I think in this environment, it's incredibly important to know, you know how, with whom, and, and when to schedule a meeting. So even though you know, phone calls and video chats and these text messaging ses sessions have kind of replaced being able to just go to the desk of a coworker and you know, ask them for help, it's also presented this really unique opportunity to expand your network of resources. So I think taking, uh, taking advantage of this, of this time is really important. Um, because even though it's, it's, been a, it's been a challenge, I think it's really been able to um, create a strong network of people that otherwise you really, you really wouldn't um, know or even know to even ask for help from. Great, thank you very much, Bella. Um, can everyone hear me? Just, okay. Um, I have a follow-up question, Bella, when you were talking about um, the different platforms, the software platforms that people use for communicating. 
and during the preparation for this uh, webinar, you had a anecdotal about um, having to learn Skype that a bunch of us yeah. that are older um, just kind of take for granted. So could you speak to, I guess, the generational um, as you're finding which platforms are, or, you know, you know, software products such as Skype or texting work better? Um, and if you're seeing any generational impacts on that use? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so I, I've personally never used something like Outlook or, or Skype. Um, I've been more of the generation of, I don't even, text messaging, I guess. Um, I would say, you know, text messaging and Gmail. Um, and I don't think anybody really was too familiar with Zoom until it just kind of came out of nowhere. But um, it's been really interesting seeing, um, I, I think that it's assumed that because I'm young, um, that I know instantly how to use the software, uh, which I think given my Given just the, the time period that I was born in, I, I think I might have a little bit more, and also my, my major, which is electrical engineering, um, I, I have a little bit more of a knack for it than maybe someone who's older, but um, there's still definitely a learning curve to these, these technologies um, that are a little bit more robust um, that I'm finding than, you know, than something that's a little bit more simplified, which is what I would use on a day-to-day -day basis, like Gmail, whereas Outlook is very, has a lot of features, it's not very, user friendly in my opinion. Um, but I've been, I've been, it's been kind of assumed that I would know how to use them. So um, it's, it's definitely been interesting that sort of dynamic where I'm teaching um, some of my uh, supervisors how to use some new technology, but then they're also super experienced using technology that I've never used before. Now oh, that's a valuable insight. And I appreciate you sharing it. Uh, it's things that we wouldn't have thought of. Um, Patty, can I have you expand a little bit more on the budgeting process? Because you touched upon that budgeting is important, um, may or may not have changed much now that we are virtual. Uh, what's the process that your company goes through to make sure you've got enough funds? So we are trying to use a lot of virtual training because of the way we're spread. Um, we're in Massachusetts and Connecticut and we have 10 stations all around, which means training becomes very difficult. Um, so the process that we have undertaken is basically by budget time, I've spent a year already researching um, all the possibilities of training. Um, that is the time for me to be able to go to the management team and say, you know what, this is how much it's going to cost, this is what's going to entail, and this is how much labor is going to, you know, create. Um, so the process is really a year ahead before budget and you come prepare with two or three bids that you think, hey, from these three, this is my best one that I think is, is the one that I want to take. Um, so year ahead and, and compare at least three businesses. Um, and it's usually also tested with other folks before you get to the budget time <laughs> of you know, what's going to work, what people are going to like. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a question coming in through chat that I think you may have touched upon in just that response. Are companies investing in continued virtual onboarding and training? And I guess if you could just directly speak. Yes, I mean, it's um, the, the reality is, is that COVID has forced us to go virtual, but there's a lot of benefits to it. Um, it, it ensures consistency when you're doing training believe it or not, <laughs> um, especially we think of virtual training just face-to-face -face through a camera, but think about computer-based training and what you can do virtually with that um, and, and spread it across the board to different employees across an organization. Um, so onboarding for ex on the health and safety and environmental field, ensuring there's consistency in the message, um, virtual training allows you to be able to do that, no matter where the folks are, um, that you are keeping some degree of consistency. So yeah, there is a definitely a trend for folks to start investing more and more. And I know we are, we are looking at it and this is kind of forcing us to look at it in more seriously. Okay, I have uh, two more questions. Um, Patty, if you could touch upon um, networking, um, a lot of, you know, back in our face-to-face -face world, we, you know, grab business cards and we use the training as a network opportunity just you know, even when we're outside of the office or to take it back and uh, deploy it within our office. 
Um, do you have any advice on, you know, how to use any of this training for continued networking? Um, to me, I, you apply the same concept that you applied when you're doing it face to face. Your instructor is your best networking. I mean, at least in my field, um, the, the instructors that I can, that I, for the courses that I go to, to kind of gain more knowledge, um, they're experts and usually on their field. So they become my resource. Um, so, you know, asking, hey, can I get your email? Making sure you ask the question at the end. Um, they're the best resource for networking. Also, um, one of the things that allows you that you didn't able to do live is the names with the companies <laughs> um you a lot of the times what i do if i see folks that hey that same person seems to be knowledgeable i write down the name and the company and guess what let's go research them at linkedin and get a connection with linkedin um so the, there is actually a benefit that we didn't know oops also like <laughs> sorry about that uh automated lights <laughs> saving energy <laughs> Um, so, so that's the networking, um, your instructor and look at the name of the person. If you have the company attached to it, write it down and search them at LinkedIn. Okay. Thank you. Last question for Bella and Bella, this goes back to, um, platforms again. Do you have any opinion on which, um, you know, text messages, phone calls, I mean, um, advice on which ones work better? Uh, for certain situations when you, you know, whether it's your um, direct um, supervisor or mentor? Um, I guess I would say, I think it's kind of a combination between uh, video chatting and um, possibly just even texting. Um, I would say with, with video chatting, um, Raytheon uh, due to security issues doesn't have, we aren't allowed to use webcams. Um, so it's been kind of a struggle um, not knowing what my coworkers look like because uh, they don't always have uh, pictures, profile pictures on their their um, their email. So I would say that would definitely be that's something that I feel like I'm missing out on is not having that face to face interaction. Um, although I know that um, setting up a video call and kind of going through the motions of a video call is a little bit stressful. Um, I think just in general. Um, so I would say. That is beneficial, I think, just you know, for a more serious conversation and a longer, a longer conversation. Um, but I've also found a lot of benefit in being able to just text um, or I am uh, a supervisor because I think it's it's been a good way to to connect quickly, efficiently, um, as well as communicate with people who who I probably won't ever meet in pe in, in person. And um, there's a lot of people across the country. Um, there's a headquarters in, in Arizona, um, and I've been able to communicate. Uh, virtually with with a lot of them um, to get some questions answered and I think if we weren't in in these times that uh, it wouldn't be I would never have met them I would never have been able to reach out to them um, but having a quick a quick uh, like I am session with them is, is really helpful well thank you very much and I, I appreciate the comment about the security I you know forget that you know our backgrounds you know are right on the internet for everyone to see and it's we all should be cognizant of what we're displaying um, yeah. So that concludes our, thank you again, Bella and Patty for being on, on the, the panel. So Maureen, do I send it back to you or my? Move it I actually, on. yeah, yeah, I okay. think you can send it right to me. Thank you right. to Marsha and Patty and Bella. That was all great information. Um, training is definitely uh, something that is in some ways better than it was before we did these things remotely and in some ways more difficult. Kind of, kind of like interviewing. Um, and that's our next topic is, is interviewing. And I just want to thank everyone uh, for taking the time again today to participate in this event. And the talented women we have on this interviewing panel have conducted many interviews over the past few months, um, both internal and external to their organizations. And we've all found that while some of the details of interviewing are very similar to when we do it in person, um, there are also some differences. So before we jump into these topics, I have a bit of information about these panel experts for this segment. I have uh, Bethany Marrier is one of our panelists. She is a senior HR advisor for NextEra Energy, the parent company for both Seabrook Nuclear Power Plant and USource, both located right here in sunny New Hampshire. In Bethany's current role, she conducts internal company investigations on a daily basis 
interviewing employees of all levels and oftentimes participates in new hire interviewing panels as well. Bethany brings over eight years of human resources experience and five years of business management experience to her role at Nextera. Secondly, I have Trisha Arling, who is a 26 year veteran of IT and engineering recruitment and is currently the talent acquisition supervisor at ISO New England. Trisha is an active member of the HR Association of Central Connecticut and teaches the recruitment and staffing class for their HR certification. She also is an adjunct professor at Central Connecticut State University, where she teaches a staffing class for their School of Management. Thank you for participating today, ladies, and welcome. Thanks, Gina. So interviewing is often nerve wracking and, and downright difficult. And uh, for today's discussion, uh, this panel has compiled a few topics based on our experience as virtual interviewers, feedback we've gotten from interviewees, and problems that we've seen as stumbling blocks and recommendations for how you can make an impression for your interviewer. At the end of the discussion, we're gonna open up the last five to 10 minutes to questions. However, if there's a topic we don't cover, a specific question you have or a horror story you'd love to share, please use the chat feature as we've been doing previously at any time during our discussion and we'll address it at the end of our hopefully brief here uh, topic presentation. So to kick off our panel discussion today will loosely pertain to the where, what, and how of virtual interviewing and of course the need for practice. So first of all, we'll start off, start off with the where and that is where should you conduct your interview? Now this is a rarely a question that you have when you do it in person, you're given a time and a place, but it's definitely a consideration when you're interviewing virtually. You need to prepare your surroundings in addition to yourself so that you don't inadvertently demonstrate your uh, lack of preparation skills, skills of preparation or focus. What is the interviewer going to see in addition to seeing you? Do you have a neutral background? Do you have decent lighting? You want to make sure that probably not like I have here with a with the light coming in back, although the light's getting a little a little darker, so it's not too bad. You want decent lighting on your face. You want to limit the distractions of pets cars driving by, kids, parents coming in and saying, Johnny, what are you doing? Um, I have a, a great story of, I was all set up for a meeting um, that was happening virtually and I thought I thought of everything. And it, you know, once everybody started talking, the bird who normally, my son's bird who normally sits in the corner and keeps to herself, minds her own business, decided she was gonna join the conversation too and started squawking loudly. So I had to you know, jump up, grab the bird, take it out and come back in, apologize profusely. and and go on, but you kind of have to expect the unexpected and figure out how you're just going to, to barrel through that. Um, I had one interviewee forget to shut off their cell phone and of course it went off you know, during the interview and again, profuse apologies um, ensued. Uh, Bethany and Trisha, what advice do you have to give about preparing yourself and your surroundings for interviews? Gina, I think you make a good point about your interviewee who shut for who forgot to shut off the phone. So it kind of ties to my thought of the mute button is your friend. And so now normally when you're interviewing for a job, you wouldn't consider having to be on mute, right? Because it's an interactive conversation. However, if you get into the longer style interviews, you're in a panel type interview, sometimes there's a break. And I think that's a key time to remember to go ahead and put yourself on mute so everyone's not hearing you blow your nose in the background, hearing you flush the toilet or whatever you're going to do. Um, I think we've all heard, heard the horror stories, um, even worse than the bird of the person who's in the bathroom. Um, and again, normally in a, in a standard interview, that wouldn't necessarily happen where, where they would hear that. But just, you know, be cognizant. The mute button is your friend. Use it if somebody is giving a little bit more lengthy of an explanation just to avoid that, that background noise. I think that's certainly something you'll, you'll want to remember there. Trisha, what have you experienced? So um, I, I, I'll say that, you know, one of, I love the expect the unexpected, right? Because something is inevitably going to go wrong, right? Today was a perfect example where technology that you thought that worked five minutes ago or even earlier doesn't work now. Um, so you have to be prepared, you have to, um, treat it like it's a real interview, like it's a face-to-face. -face. Um, be prepared, be, be flexible. I, I love to say tuck and roll. So your ability to handle the things that get thrown at you from a dog jumping on your lap to a bird squawking um, to 
technology not working. I think you have to, the cat jumping. Thank you, Corey, for, for timing on explain, explore, explaining that and showing an example of that for us. Um, but your ability to handle those things are what's going to matter. Your ability to tuck and roll, your ability to, um, you know, be able to quickly move and pivot and carry on is going to be vital. Um, another thing is to be prepared for the types of questions that you may have. So, um, you know, being prepared and especially in this new environment about different um, questions that you may get asked. So Bethany, I'll throw it back to you to talk about, um, you know, being prepared for certain questions, uh, especially with COVID and how are you gonna handle certain things that you may not have been prepared or even asked for um, in past interviews. Yeah, I think that's a really great point. And like Gina said, one of the things we're gonna consider is the what, right? What are those questions that we're going to get asked? And so I think some of your top questions you want to be prepared for in today's world that you wouldn't have been prepared for seven months ago is that question of how are you balancing working remotely, right? Many people have gone to that remote work status and companies want to know how you're balancing that. You'll probably get asked one of the standard canned questions that comes in other aspects, which is what have you found most challenging? about working remotely or what's most difficult, right? They try to trip you up a little bit to try to get you to show your flaws a little bit. And so be prepared for those questions like you would be prepared for any other interview. I think the other one um, to be prepared for is interviewee interviewees asking you, is this a job for right now or is this a job that you're looking for long-term? Because Companies realize that employees are getting laid off or employees are furloughed and they really want to make sure they're making the best decision for their company. So just be prepared for that answer and be honest with your answers and with those that are interviewing you. And then last, I always say, be prepared. I think, um, Trisha, you said it, for the unexpected. And so every now and then you get an interviewee who might ask that inappropriate question. And in today's times, it's going to be something, I guarantee you, that's like, Oh, so do you have kids that are at home right now? How are you working with those kids? And how, how are you juggling the kids talking in the background? And they're going to try to get you into engaging in that. And if that's not something you're comfortable sharing, just be prepared for that question and know what your answer is going to be when that question comes around. And hopefully it won't. Hopefully they'll steer clear. Um, but it's all about knowing what those questions are going to be and, and what your answers are going to be. Um, and so I think the other thing we've talked about is, is conducting ourselves, right? And so Trisha, what advice would you give people about how they're conducting themselves, how they're, they're answering questions? Absolutely. So as you mentioned before, Bethany, this is very, we are still interviewing for a job, right? We're just doing it in a different posture. So you have to think about, um, you know, so much has not changed from before. So somebody I just saw, you know, what is suitable attire for a virtual interview. So the same thing that would be suitable for if you were showing up on site, right? So that has not changed. Um, conducting yourself and preparing yourself for an on-site interview is the exact same thing that we want you to be doing for an, a WebEx, right? So when we moved the entire posture in a day from we're having in on-site to WebEx, in my opinion, I expected nothing to change from a candidate's point of view. That candidate will be on time, that candidate will dress professionally, that candidate will conduct themselves professionally, they will not put their feet up. Um, I was saying, when we were talking about what we were gonna talk about today, you know, the, uh, the casual like, hey, you know, so I like to kind of hang out and I'm, you know, so this kind of thing, is extremely distracting to anybody and it shows the same kind of posture that you're not interested. You're too cool for school, whatever. So that you wanna make sure that you're not, if you are a fidgeter, that you do not sit in a chair that allows you to fidget, right? So this is the perfect chair to fidget in and it's extremely distracting. So you wanna make sure that when you set yourself up, you set yourself up in as professional of a circumstance as you possibly can so that you can maintain your professionalism, right? Now, the other thing, 
again, I'll say tuck and roll because cats will jump on your desk, the doorbell is going to ring, your dog is going to bark, the mailman's going to show up, right? All of those things are going to happen at the most inopportune moment, right? No interviewee, I'm not expecting it to go perfectly, but I am watching to see how you handle it. Can you tuck and roll? Can you acknowledge it? Oh, sorry, my cat. Or, oh, I apologize, the doorbell rang. You know, your ability to carry on is going to be rated, right? So that's what you need to be prepared for, right? So the other thing I will to say, and we, we've said it at least twice already, we're going to say it again and again, practice. If you have not seen yourself on video, you need to practice. Right? So your mannerisms, how do you look, how do you talk, how do you swivel, how do you shake, you should know how you do that. And not that you shouldn't do it, but you should know that, be mindful of how maybe distracting that might be or how that can be perceived. So both Bethany and I have said, you know, I'm, I'm willing to um, practice with anyone. I even put that out to my candidates. If you need a five minute, 10 minute, um, just we were saying just as though you would drive to work you would drive to the interview rather to see how it is and where am I going to go where am I going to show up same thing I'm going to go on the zoom meeting I'm going to go on Webex I'm going to make sure my technology works I'm going to make sure that everything is set up I'm going to make sure I know what I look like which I can see that sun shining in my so maybe I would pivot <laughs> as best I could to have that so all of that preparedness is extremely important right um and, and i thought that was not not to interrupt you but i thought it was a very interesting um not something i had thought of before was having being able to ask you know if if you are in a situation where you're not comfortable with the technology or the platform and much in the way bella was saying where you know maybe we expect our interviewers or interviewees to know how to use zoom but if they haven't used it before you know as an interviewee don't be afraid to say hey i haven't used this platform before i you know i want to put my best foot forward for you can we do a quick five minute practice i think that's not something i would have thought of but really really great advice Absolutely. And, and to Bella's point, too, it kind of resonated with me when she said, just because I'm young doesn't mean I know every platform, right? And I've had young folks say, I don't even, I've never used WebEx before. And I'll tell them, just put it on your phone, because you're so used to using apps on your phone, that may be your easiest way to work with the tool, right? Yeah. Great. So, um, so I thought uh, we covered the, the, the where, the what, and the who, and we've got a couple questions um, on the chat feature that, that uh, came up. Um, and one of them was about eye contact. Someone talked about eye contact being tricky on Zoom calls. And looking at the camera directly can be very disconcerting and hard because you really want to look down at who you're, who you're, you feel like you're looking at the, somebody's eyes. So we, we kind of need to retrain ourselves a little bit to look at the camera. And, and that's how we address, you know, we don't want to stare into it. That can get really kind of, you know, scary. But, um, you know, I think practicing looking into the camera can be, can be something that is another practice piece. And it's tricky for us as well. You know, keep in mind that even though Bethany and I do, you know, interviews all the time, this technology and where to look is, I know for me, I still, because as soon as I'm like, oh, am I looking in the right place? Well, I look at myself and I, I don't know, I'm hoping, I'm hoping it's good, right? So I think to some degree you can't get overly hung up on that because we're, we're all struggling a little bit with exactly where to look and how to um, maintain that eye contact that you would normally maintain and very easily in a in a face-to-face -face scenario. Yeah, and Bella makes a really good point that you can move the view of the speaker if you if you move who you're speaking to right to underneath the camera that that can definitely help. Um, let's see. And I think the other thing you're going to want to remember uh, in these situations for those of us that are operating off dual cameras or dual screens, and this is something we see quite a bit, and I'm guilty of, I try to remember to split my screen. So there's features that allow you to have zoom on one half of the screen and something else in the other versus having the camera or having a laptop. Like I have my laptop over here and I might be inclined to turn my head a little more. So just be mindful that if you're a two screen user, you're going to also want to be extra careful of turning your whole body and being focusing on whatever is over there. Exactly. 
All right, I do have another question um, from someone saying, I like to handwrite notes in meetings as a virtual interviewee, is this a no-no? It's a good question. I, I, I have to take notes. Um, that's the way I remember each candidate. So I encourage candidates that wouldn't bother me at all. I think that they should be taking notes. In fact, I'm, you know, that, that speaks that they're very interested and they like what's being said or they want to remember what's being said. So I, I think it's acceptable. Yeah, I would definitely agree with you, Tricia. Absolutely acceptable. One thing to be mindful of is always that noise if you're not going to hand write the notes. And so I've definitely found myself getting tripped up on this when I'm interviewing people over the phone. I do a lot of phone interviews and I've heard people say to me, Oh, I can, and you can hear the, the tipping, yeah, that clipping noise. So just be careful in an interview. That's probably definitely the time you want to have the notepad next to you, and it's just a little less distracting to, to take those notes. But absolutely, take notes. I agree. That is a great point. You you don't realize how loud the the keyboard is when it's right next to the speaker. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> All right, well, this has been a great discussion and there are a couple additional questions that we have, but I am going to have to put the, the time gavel down and move along to our next segment. Thank you, Tricia and Bethany. And our next segment is collaborative meetings. So I'm handing it over to Maureen and her group. Hi, so thank you very much, Gina. And uh, this has been really great so far. I hope everyone else feels they're getting something, if not a bunch of things, out of listening to everyone. And I love that there's such a variety of roles that people play and, and age groups represented and you know just experiences. So um, I think that really plays into collaborative meetings because a lot of the meetings that we now get onto on phones or, or on computers that it does have this sort of a mixture um, and then some, you know, obviously, you know, there's a bunch of really intelligent women together. And so there's a comfort level. Um, and sometimes you start adding change, you know, differences and, and some of the old politics do fall into play. So I think we're going to be talking a little bit about that um, on this uh, session, but so how many of you get excited about each virtual meeting that you're going to get on each day? <laughs> Hands up. Anyone get really excited about every meeting that they get on? Each one, maybe one of them, but not so, each so, one. <laughs> so they're all really well run, right? There's always an agenda, right? You always know what your job's going to be or why you got invited and why you're participating, right? <laughs> maybe. Maybe not all the time. Um, hopefully you at least know what the meeting's about. Sometimes, I have to admit, I get on a call and I'm looking, it's like even the title's not really clear what it's about. And it gets really tricky, um, I find, because I deal with a lot of outside clients and sometimes the meeting invitation comes from them. And you know, I may have a practice of making sure that I say you source in the subject line, the client name in the subject line, and something about what the meeting is about in the subject line. That doesn't always come back. So sometimes it's, it's tricky, especially agendas seem to have kind of fallen by the wayside. Um, so, so yeah. Um, so I would say, though, there are memorable meetings, and those are the ones that you do get on. They're like, even if there's technical issues or something else, they do end up being useful. You know why you came to the call, why you got on the meeting. You know what your role could be, but there's nothing wrong with getting more practice and more tips about how to get more out of those meetings and how to be more recognized in the meetings. Um, it's trickier now um, where you come to a, a big, board meeting table and everyone sits down, sometimes there's understood roles. Well, those roles don't have to, you know, this is a chance for change, really. And I think there's been a lot of change over six months. Um, this discussion is really going to be about how to participate, how to plan them in this virtual world. And without holding up any more time, um, I'd like to 
invite my good friend Nikki and ask uh, her. She is the VP for Geo Insight. And uh, Nikki Delude Roy, I've, I think we've known each other about six years, maybe more. Yeah. And uh, she knows a lot about meetings. And then we'll also have Susanna Wall, Suzanne Wall, sorry, not Susanna, Suzanne Wall, who uh, is sisters with Carter Wall, uh, who is a big leader in Nui and has just been a champion of all women in energy and the environment. Um, and she is with the Mass Teachers Association, but she also is the head of the union. Is this true? Okay, she plays a big role in the union. So she's involved in a lot of meetings. So with that, go ahead, Nikki, thank you. Great, thanks Maureen. Um, hi everybody. Um, I just uh, I, I figured I would just quickly start as an introduction. Um, so I am VP at Geo Insight, and, um, but really I've been in environmental consulting uh, since my very first high school job. I started out as my first summer job in consulting. And so I've, um, I've been through a lot of meetings, as Mo said, uh, although I'm only 29, so it's really not that many meetings. Um, <laughs> but I wanted to talk, to talk through a few of the challenges that I think as women, we in particular face when it comes to meetings. Um, and then some of the opportunities, I think trying to put a positive spin on things. Um, that this virtual environment has offered us as women in particular. Um, I'm going to caveat everything by the fact that my dog is making all kinds of noise because it's after five and we usually go for a walk right now. <laughs> so I apologize for my background noise. Um, I want to start by um, asking everybody on the call to use your reaction button. So if you haven't experienced this, it's, um, there's a little smiley face to the right of the share your screen at the very bottom of your Zoom window. Um, so we're just going to take a quick poll. So if you could use your thumbs up reaction button. Um, I'm going to start by asking some questions about what I call our uh, pre-COVID three-dimensional world, and then I'll transition to what we're seeing in this now one-dimensional sort of virtual world. So thumbs up if you've ever been in a meeting and looked around and had that sinking feeling um, that, yep, here's another one. I'm the only woman in the room. Okay, perfect. Look like, looks like pretty much everyone. Um, use your thumbs button, thumbs up button a second time um, once these kind of go, there we go. Um, if this feels easier or at least different in this virtual world, if that sense of, oh, it's just me again, sort of is different virtually. Okay, cool. I know for me, it feels very different. It doesn't feel quite so, um, so laden with that anxiety that I think it provoked earlier um, in our one dimensional world. Um, how about using thumbs up button if you have um, ever walked into a room and realized that all the men were dressed in their sort of standard attire of a polo shirt or a white button down shirt and some khakis and you felt that dread of, oh, I'm either overdressed or underdressed for a meeting. And um, I know for me, this becomes much easier in this one dimensional world where um, we, you kind of know that everybody's wearing sweatpants from the, at least the waist down, right? And so it kind of takes that away as well. So there's, there's another benefit. Um, <laughs> Suzanne points out the golf shirts, right? Um, again, sort of thumbs up. Um, how many of us women have either been asked outright or felt pressured to be the note taker in a meeting? Yep, Gina's nodding her head profusely. Um, I know for me, again, that sort of, um, this becomes much easier in a Microsoft Teams environment where we can collaboratively, um, as Suzanne's gonna do through this chat, kind of add, um, add our thoughts to the chat and then you can actually generate a, an outcome or a product um, that, that really everybody is able to contribute to, to uh, in a positive way as you go along. Um, I guess lastly, last thumbs up reaction, um, if you've ever felt like you had to hide your sort of personal life from the people you work with, your managers or your clients. And so for me personally, there's a lot of thumbs up there and I'm sorry to hear that. Um, for me personally, I spent much of my kids elementary and middle school years working part time and quite frankly living in fear 
um, that my clients find out that I was only working part time. Um, I didn't, I did never want anyone to question my commitment, right? And so there's that need to sort of hide behind a facade of, yeah, I've got, I've got it all. Um, and I felt like um, I always got even more frustrated by inefficiency in meetings, right? Because how dare I go into a meeting and come out of it and not know why we're just spent that hour and a half talking in circles because I have a very small finite amount of time that I have to um, focus and I want that to be as productive as possible. And I guess I always felt like my time management challenges were my, I'll say my dirty little secret here, right? Like I had to deal with that on my own and make sure that that facade was always that I've got it all, I'll bring it on. Yes, of course I can take on another project, another client, another uh, mentor or mentee. Um, so I think one of the positives for me has been that although in the virtual world we've transitioned to, um, we now have even more significant kid balancing issues, homeschooling, the really heavy emotional decisions around, can I let my kid go to the playground or is that too risky? Um, do I send my kids back remote or full in person and all of those challenges are incredibly heavy. I think the benefit is that we are literally seeing into each other's lives, right? I'm seeing Lori, Laurel's you know, kitchen or whatever room. I'm seeing Mo, Mo's bedroom, which as close as we are, I've never been able to see before. With crutches. <laughs> Her pillowcase. Um, and it's really a, a, a game changer, right? Because it's not that I'm just seeing into Mo's bed, bedroom, but I'm also seeing into my male counterparts. Um, lives, my clients, I'm seeing the inside of their homes as well. And so um, I think we as women aren't necessarily challenged as much to hide some of those multitasking um, issues that we've had to struggle with. And so that's one of the real benefits to moving to this one dimensional um, sort of world and having meetings in this way. So um, I guess it, it, what it, leaves me with is the thought that organizations like GeoInsight, and I'm sure like yours, have really had to um, be open to the fact that one size doesn't fit all. It never really has, but I think now it's really leveled the playing field and we know that it doesn't, one size doesn't fit all, fit, fit all and that we're really all doing our best in the moment to kind of take on and, and, and make things happen um, around the other requirements our lives demand of us. So. I'd love to hear other ways that online meetings are resulting in positive, either personal or professional um, growth. So uh, I guess raise your hand if you have something you wanna offer. Um, I know, Laurel, maybe you can start for me. Sure. Um, you know, I, one of the things that I um, have found, and I just put it in the chat, it's, it's so much easier to be myself when I'm alone in a room rather than being uh, in a room where I want to fit in uh, to, to look and act like everyone else in that room when I perhaps am not a member of the majority in a, in a conference room. Um, and it really ties into, I love that we can um, kind of have our whole self in our workplace in these meetings now. And it's not that I'm one person at work and I'm another person at home. And the intersection of those two might only be in the car during my commute. Those days are over. Um, and I love that. I think there's so much opportunity to really, um, you know, bring our whole selves and our best selves wherever we are. Um, and I think it's a, it's a great opportunity. It's a little strange still after seven months of, of being alone in my living room, um, but it, it's working. Laurel, can I just ask, do you find that there then is more collaboration in meetings? Like, because we now know each other better, whether we wanted to or not, um, do you think that that opens up, you know, men are definitely more vulnerable. Um, you know, they're not just standing in the end of the meeting room doing their golf swing you know, or whatever. Um, their kids are coming up to them and they're dealing with virtual learning. Are you finding that that leads to more personal sharing, which then also takes down some of the barriers to sharing professionally. Yeah, I, you know, I think that um, before we can fully collaborate in a way that we want to, instead of our forced to, we have to trust each other on a whole different level. And I think it's happening with, with men 
uh, revealing a little bit more of, of themselves and women revealing more of themselves and not just men to women, but women to women. Because I know we always talk about being women, you know, kind of in a, in a predominantly male environment, um, which is one side of the competition, but the other side of the competition is women competing with women, um, which has, that's a whole topic for another day. But um, I do, I think there's more trust because I think you know, it, one of the terms I've heard recently is about transformational leadership instead of transactional leadership. Um, and it's and it's that ability to to really care and ask, how are you doing? So you have these men leaders that are they have to know how their employees are balancing the remote working. And they didn't have to ask before. If you showed up in the office, they assumed you were okay. And now they have to go out of their way to ask those questions. That's I like it. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Suzanne, are you, uh, do you want to jump in and give us some practical tips for mm. you making the most of the moments that we have, all of us collectively? <laughs> sure. It's good to go last because you guys have been brilliant and came up with it all already. So um, I, I am Carter Wall's sister, and I really am very inspired by the work that you do in NUI, so thank you. I work now as the higher ed director of Mass Teachers Union, and we've been doing uh, online one-on-one -on -one meetings and running Zoom meetings of up to 10,000 people. So it's been a challenge. I've learned a lot. Uh, and because I work with everyone from faculty who talk a lot, to engineers and scientists who really need to be listened to. I have uh, developed some experience with creating meetings that are both effective and engaging. So I'm gonna talk about three things and uh, Debbie Crooks is gonna help me by posting some resources at the end. So I won't go through the blah, blah a lot. Um, part of what I learned or relearned in this online world is from this book, Death by Meeting. Whoa. Uh, death by meeting, uh, probably you relate to this because I think we've all but experienced the zombie, the, the feeling that your brain is being eaten by Zoom. Uh, so the, the uh, text in the death by meeting book is, uh, the full title is a leadership fable about solving the most painful problem in business. And the author says the good news is that it's entirely possible to transform meetings into things that are even fun, productive and even fun. Uh, so I liked that last piece that Laurel added about transformational. I think that can be part of how we relate to each other on Zoom. Um, the bad news is to do that transformation really re re requires a rethink. So I'm gonna recommend three rethinks to you. Uh, the Death by Meeting book lists all the ways that meetings are deadly. We've touched on a lot of them already. So I won't go through it. I was gonna ask you to give the thumbs up and down. Um, but I think what everybody would say is that many meetings, whether it's in the 3D world or the one dimensional online world, the, meeting, the agenda may be poorly organized. So as your first rethink, I wanna recommend that you uh, adopt a practice that's called POP, which is for each meeting that you're doing, to write down ahead of time, this is a discipline, write down what's the purpose of the meeting, what are the outcomes you wanna achieve, and what process you're gonna to use to get them. And in the handout, this uh, web link that I just threw up will be repeated uh, with a little bit more about what a POP is. It takes a while to get used to moving away from thinking about an agenda as being about the order of business or Robert's rules or what votes you have to take uh, but it's really a very worthwhile and rewarding discipline to kind of get your head back in the game of what is the reason that we're all together and what's the nice balance of relationship building and information sharing and doing business in a meeting. So as the second rethink, uh, I stole shamelessly from Debbie Crook. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, so there'll be a resource which goes through a lot of the tips that we already talked about, but the rethink itself is how can you make technology your friend to enhance participation and engagement in meetings, not just to kind of get through the subject matter. 
Um, so there were a lot of good tips that we shared already. The one that I think Debbie uh, practices very well is to do something called a run of show. So this is a little different from an agenda. It's actually charting out what time you're starting, what's the topic, who's the speaker, what's the AV you need. So the cue at which you say, please pop that in the chat, would go into your run of show document. And it, it does keep you pretty well organized. So, and the technology can also, if it's your friend, can support engagement. I had a couple examples to give. The one I like the most is when we run these meetings of 10,000 people, we actually will pause for about 60 seconds. We'll ask a question and ask people to put in their own comments. And I gotta tell you, it's kind of thrilling to see, you know, a thousand answers come in, boom, into your Zoom. And then we save that chat and then send it out to all the participants afterwards uh, so that they really have a chance to collectivize the thinking that was occurring. So it's the advantage of having some time to self-reflect in the middle of a meeting, but also to share or collectivize that reflection. And then the last topic is really to continue to develop your own leadership by supporting other women's participation in meetings. A couple of people said this already, which is great. Um, many years ago, because I've been in the labor movement for 40 years, many years ago, I was one of only five women elected to the Labor Council of 600 members. Most of those members were from the building trades and from aerospace uh, industry. And uh, you can imagine sexist comments were pretty much the norm. Uh, so we got the five women together and plotted and schemed. And every time in the meeting that something sexist was said, we would play a funny old fashioned noise. It's the Ooga. <laughs> and uh, eventually the uh, brothers, they were all brothers of color, joined us in also doing the Ooga. And we actually retrained that labor council on the spot to be more participatory and more welcoming of women speaking in meetings. Um, and now the, the end of the story, the bookend, is one of those five women is now the second officer of the national AFL-CIO coming out of the uh, International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, which she renamed the International Bunch of Electrical Workers. So uh, if we were able to do it in that kind of atmosphere, I know that the women of Nui can do that. Um, so I would say that if you're the facilitator of a meeting, you can really help add techniques, norms, expectations, ways to identify people who want to participate, and really uphold that participation. So one of the handouts, which uh, Debbie's going to put up in a minute, um, has a couple more techniques for how do you manage that, either as a facilitator or as a participant. Um, and I think continue to share tips within Nui, like using the uh, backdrop to hide your home life or your messy office uh, is good. And um, I, I think most of all, I just want to encourage you to keep networking and sharing those ideas and developing your own leadership. So we're going to post those resources. And then I think Mo is going to keep us going by facilitating a summary discussion about what's what's next for developing leadership online and check in with you all and see what else you're interested in uh, sharing, developing, or looking for. So thanks so much and good luck. Well, thank you very much. Um, I know that we're over time, so if anyone has to drop, we understand. Uh, I will try to get um, these links out to everyone. I'm not so clear on how you do that, but Suzanne, I'm sure you can help us out with that, just so we make sure that um, this really important information is not lost if some of us don't know how to download the chat. Um, so I, I did, before I move on to anything else, I did want to say a, a, a big thank you to the session leaders, the panelists who they shared their stories, their sense of humor, um, and their wisdom. I, I also want to thank Jennifer McNeil um, she's the one that gets the word out for us. Um, Debbie Crooks, she is our wizard behind the Zoom curtain. Uh, without her, 
this would not be running smoothly and she saved the day for me. Um, so thank you, Debbie. Um, also, uh, I, and also Debbie agreed to stay on uh, and keep this running longer so that we could have a little discussion afterwards. Also, you know, just our sisters who are, you know, in Nui out of Boston, um, we're a new chapter. We've only been around a couple of years. And um, the support they're giving us is phenomenal. And, you know, it's heartfelt. Like we, we know um, they're really supporting our efforts. And so that means a lot to all of us. Um, and, and they were the ones that said the heck yeah, of course you want to run one of these sessions. Um, and they said, and, and let's have another one in November. Uh, and then also the primary thank you is to all of you because without you, this session wouldn't be it wouldn't be the same and your stories have been great. Um, so with that, I think, you know, unmute yourselves. Um, a question would be, you know, November 5th, we have a chance to have another hour, maybe an hour and a half. Uh, what, what topics or topic do you feel needs a deeper dive? Is it one of these or is it, is it something else you're, you really feel is important right now to know? Can we unmute? Is is everyone muted on purpose or? No, they can unmute. The they can, can unmute themselves. themselves. Okay, talk away. We've all been talking. <laughs> I think we might. I'll start off. I I think, you know, hearing people are still still going to be virtual, like in July of two twenty twenty one. Um, we may find that, you know, where we didn't have this issue before, how do you sustain being virtual? You know, I wonder if that is going to be a, a topic that how do you stay fresh or, I don't, you know, you can do something for a small amount of time, but to do it for months on end. Well, it was, and, and it was also one of the conversations we kind of got into with the interviewing segment too, was how do we come out of this? You know, I mean, we, you know, we kind of all got shoved into being virtual and we've kind of gone along, but what does it look like on the other side? You know, if we do get to the other side, what is it, what does it look like when we're asked to go back to the office? Um, you know, what do we do then? Or how even does this change our workspace? and um, the future for workers going forward. We did a survey and I feel a lot of workers are expecting or wanting some um, more remote capabilities than what they had pre-COVID. So it'd be and interesting I, to see how other companies are adapting to that. So I, I agree, I just, Corey. I think we're, we're seeing a lot of people already asking now if they can stay remote forever, right? So those that are finding that their personal lives just, it's more conducive for them for whatever reason. And so we're already getting people saying, well, can I at least do 50-50? So we as a company just started to embark on this remote work thing and letting managers choose what they wanna do and what's good for them. And now they're being forced into it. And they're now employees are forcing that question constantly. Right. What's it going to look like come January when we're supposedly going back to the office? I don't know. So if I, I know for me as a, a... In, you know, as a recruiter, I, I'm, I don't need to go in the office until we're, visitors can come on site. And so when will that be? Right. So if I can just put it from perspective, you, some of you have been lucky um, or some of us have been lucky. Um, I belong to a critical infrastructure. We've been working. We've yeah. been in the field. Yeah. Um, and, and I can explain how we did it. Um, our operators, our maintenance crew has been in the station since this whole thing started. So in a way, all of us being home, we've been the lucky ones and they're not been the lucky ones. All right, so they haven't had, they're, they're the ones struggling more the balance of home and life than the rest of us. So when we look at it, um, I made the decision personally, when I was given the flexibility in July, I said to my boss, I have to go back. I cannot continue to do my work remotely. I'm an EHS person. I have to be where my guys are. 
you know. Um, so you do allows you some flexibility, but it, it is going to be different when you go because all of a sudden all of us have some degree of flexibility. How many days do I go in and how many days do I stay home? And, and I'm doing that. I temporarily come in for a couple of days and then on certain days I'm at home and depends on what we're doing. So the flexibility is to me that is going to be different for industry in general, but the adjustment or the, the one thing that I think we all tend to forget is that there's a group of, a huge group of population of employees that have been working through all of this and that have, are not experiencing what we're experiencing and they're going, what's the big deal? <laughs> because they're struggling. So it's a different perspective that we also have to keep in mind um, of this group of employees that are seeing what we're doing and not completely understanding and having the same struggles. So just different way. <laughs> any any thoughts from people who have not been presenting? So Lisa, I'd love to love to hear you. So I'm going to get back on my bandwagon. Um, when I joined the meeting tonight, my first uh, uh, my first glance around the room was to see how many young members uh, of NUI were participating. Um, so what the demographic was of who was participating and um, I really enjoyed my role as a mentor last year and so I'm always looking for who are we talking to um, and I, I guess I, like who is our audience um, and I would like to see some programming that really attracts more of our young members to participate um, when we were all in our 20s, we didn't have this amazing community to support us and to help us along the path. And I really see that as one of particularly New Hampshire Newey's critical roles. And so as we look at programming for November, I would love to hear from the younger people here, uh, particularly as to what they would like to see and what they think others would be attracted to participate in. Or even more, what what would they be comfortable being a panelist, or what do they feel that they're an expert on, right? So that they could participate and, and present themselves. Like Bella did such a great job with that today. Oh, um, yes, excellent. So Brittany and Bella and Corey and I don't know the age of the people uh, on the bottom of the, who aren't showing their pictures, but and Stephanie. Um, can you, uh, do you have any thoughts about how we can use this platform to be particularly supportive of um, younger workers in, in uh, and younger members of NUI? Um, I will say that uh, I might be new to NUI, but my company is not. Um, so um, I also don't want to speak for everybody but um yeah i mean i am mid 20s um i also think i have a very unique position where uh i am pretty high up in my company at in my mid 20s so um i'm not looking for the mentorship that maybe other mid 20 year olds are um yeah but i guess like to your point lisa about like if you guys wanted me to do be a panelist more than happy to um I do marketing for revision and I've been in this position for almost five years. Um, so yeah, I feel like I'm pretty well equipped in social media marketing, um, which again, I think is just like a classic, oh, you're a millennial, you know how to do social media. So um, I don't know if that's good or bad. I also, maybe that, that would be helpful for everybody in this group is having a millennial present on social media marketing. Or maybe, uh, maybe to take your role differently, what's it like to be um, a fairly high up millennial in a company that is going to meetings where generationally you are the youngest person in the room? Mm. Always the youngest person in the room. Always. <laughs> only, only females in the room as well. Um, as, uh, yeah. Um, 
so I can see where that we're sharing that information would be valuable, particularly to um, younger staff who are again walking into boardrooms or meeting rooms and feeling like they're 50, they're only sitting around the table with people who are their grandparents' age, and that can seem kind of intimidating. Um, mm -hmm. And so I can see where that might be uh, that might be a great uh, opportunity for you to contribute. Confidence. Bella or Stephanie, do you guys have some, do ladies have some, or Corey? Corey? Yeah, How um, I, I think I actually have uh, two points um, that I was just thinking. I think the first one um, is more of, a, I guess, a suggestion for an event sort of uh, platform, I guess. Um, I know some of the uh, the ways that like Raytheon has tried to get some of the younger people to network um, is by holding like trivia nights, um, which I think has gotten really good turnout. Um, and I think a lot of people like to do um, some sort of trivia night on, like a Friday night or something like that. So it's kind of a, a good way, I think, to network with just within the, um, within the organization, um, as well as uh, for an event topic, I think, like I had kind of touched upon, I, I really struggled, um, I think, with, with figuring out um, how to reach out to people um, and I guess the etiquette behind it uh, in general. So, you know, do I organize a meeting if I have a question with my, with my supervisor or do I let him, organize, him or her organize a meeting? Um, you know, what's the email etiquette for that? Because it's not really stuff that you learn in school. And I think since this will probably be going on for a while, um, having some sort of guidance with, um, you know, okay, I've got, I've, I've got a question. How do I, how do I approach that? How do I um, kind of go about doing that? And what's the most appropriate way to kind of uh, accomplish that? So, so business etiquette in general. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Business and especially, you know, email, e even email etiquette and, and all that stuff. Cause I think, you know, I've, I've learned how to do it in person, but now that it's kind of all virtual, it's, um, it's definitely a lot trickier. Yeah, I would say I've experienced since we've gone to this virtual world, I think there's definitely an uptick in that virtual communication that people probably, I like your idea, Bella, of that I think we could almost call it virtual etiquette, right? It's even IM. So our company just went to allowing employees to use Teams for chat versus Skype. In the new Teams chat, there's a feature that you can send memes and you can send GIFs. And I work in the compliance space of HR and I literally went, oh my gosh, please no. <laughs> because people are going to start sending inappropriate GIFs or whatever they're called and inappropriate memes. And when yeah. is it add the smiley face to the end and uh, I mean I'll, I'll share with you all you know like I said I do investigations and I had an employee come and tell me how absolutely unprofessional it was of her coworker to send her boss an email that said hey Bethany and and that was just absolutely so bothersome and I, I really had to try to put on my most understanding hat to try to figure out why that was so bothersome, but she said, that's just not good etiquette. And I, on the other end, was going, I don't see it. But, you know, I think that's, I love that topic. I think that's so relevant right now. You know, if, could I add the, um, the other tie that with the etiquette, and I think we touched on it, was um, intergeneration communication. Um, and so we always talk about diversity in the workplace being gender right now is a big or race, um, color. And um, when you look at the divide, I'll say, between generations in the workplace, if, generation, if the workplaces can't create collaborative, um, cohesive teams among generations, when people may not be retiring until they're 70 now, and they're coming into the workforce when they're 20. That's a huge divide between how we communicate, what we think is acceptable, what etiquette is. I mean, it's been a long time since I've been in my 20s, but at least 15 years ago when I was at PSNH, I had a member of the legal team use a word in an email that is, I would refer to it as what my vacuum does, but I would never use it in an email. And I thought it was completely inappropriate. 
but for many people, it, they saw nothing wrong with it. So I think it's a, a really good topic for some future um, discussions of that, that etiquette among or between generations. Right. And, and, and to be sensitive, like you want to be, you know, this is virtual professional. It's, it's what you might think, oh, this is okay. This is how I talk or, you know, well, you know, most sitting in her bedroom, I can say anything. Um, it's, it's having that self-control and thinking about, well, when I want to become that person's VP, or if I want to elevate myself, those little things that are details about how you conduct yourself as a business professional will carry on and people won't forget it if it's something that struck them as being not okay. Um, so it is, I think it would be very helpful. And, and to the point, um, Bethany, it was really funny when people started sending me, I'm in the older generation, people started sending me emails that started with, hey, I'd be, I would be like, what? Like, who writes hey? And then I realized that's just what they do. And it's, it's like, oh, okay, like, it's, it's all right. Um, I couldn't look to my sons. They're, they're blue collars, so they're not, you know, firefighters. They, they write hey, I'm sure. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it was just, but, but it also didn't alarm me. It just seemed like, well, that's a little casual. And that's like, but is that a big deal? To some people, maybe it would be. And, and it's tied to the perception of, you know, we may perceive it as casual because, you know, whatever background, you know, 16 yeah. years of Catholic school was my background. Um, so I, know, I think it's very casual. But for someone else, they may not perceive it as casual. So it's that awareness of we're bringing really unique perspectives. And it's not out of disrespect. But how do we, you know, how do we all play in that world? Has anyone not spoken yet who would like to say something? I feel like there's still a few minutes left and we'd love to hear from everyone. Um, I haven't said anything yet. I'm uh, kind of an interesting position where I took some time off um, from working with, to spend time raising my small children and I've decided to go back to work during a pandemic which let me tell you is so much fun. So anything on like the, the, all this has been useful, but the networking, I mean, the, you can't go to meetings now and talk to people and connect in the usual fashion. So even the etiquette of connection, like, um, I, I, I'm doing a lot of research and I'm trying to network with people, but it almost feels, and I know this is terrible, but like internet talking, which we just <laughs> we used to be able to make a connection in person, that's kind of gone. So any information and help, and this, some of the stuff that you guys talked about earlier has is, is been really helpful, but it's a little bit, um, it's not a barrier, but it just makes it a little bit more, you know, harder, I guess, to try to get back into the workforce now with all the virtual and, and it does it keeps everyone but now we're not going back to work till in person till january and now it's next summer and it just keeps getting pushed that it's kind of overcoming all the barriers so, so are we all having the same hearing pro? Can you hear me fine? Yes, I think I think Stephanie's um, bandwidth is probably yeah. okay. So, yeah. so I think it was really just how do you do networking when you're looking for a job during a pandemic? And again, it it comes back to to etiquette. Um, and I, I that might I I think we'll do a little poll offline and 
think about this and come back with maybe a couple of topics and have the membership vote on what we do for November 5th. But it sounds yeah, like it is starting to be the way we seem to be moving. And, and, and sticking with virtual, sticking with, you know, etiquette, etiquette and continuing to be virtual because we think we're going to be there and, and how do we kind of marry those. And then, and then I think like Lisa had indicated, getting getting you know some younger members on the panel and and getting your experiences and your viewpoints on on the etiquette as well so we probably will be reaching out to you and asking you if you want to participate on panels so you have to say yes so stay tuned right um so thank you to everyone of course the sun now comes out and makes my room bright but hey <laughs> it's a good exit but thank you everyone who was on a panel everyone who stayed through to the end uh, great participation and we're really proud to be part of Nui and we're proud of all of you um, for everything that you're doing. So keep it up and we'll be in touch. Now Maureen, Everybody. I have one other, one oh, other question. For those of us that attended, do we get to circulate a attendance list so that we can network from there? I think that would be appropriate. Uh, I'll check in with Nui hierarchy and make sure that's okay. Um, but I, I can't see a reason why not, but um, I'll just check in before I say yes. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Bye everybody, good night. Thank you so much. Good night. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks everybody.